My name is Ariel Molino. I lead the Sankop Forum in Africa, and we're delighted to have so many of you guys joining us for our 10th and final series of, of Partnering to Crush the Curve with AVPA. Um, we'd love to actually, as you guys come in, let us know where you're coming from and let us know how many you've joined us for. Have you been here for all 10? Have you been, is this your first uh, webinar with us, maybe second or third? Um, would just love to know uh, where you guys are coming from and uh, yeah, and how many times you, you've been with us today. I do see already several familiar faces. Hi, Mercy. You're definitely on your third or fourth, I think, by now. <laughs> um, Great, so I think we'll, uh, uh, I will go ahead and, and turn it over to Frank uh, to give some welcoming remarks for everyone. Um, I would just request for those of you who are joining, please do uh, keep yourselves on mute um, so that we can avoid any background noise. Frank, over to you. Thank you, Ariel, and welcome everyone once again. Um, as Ariel mentioned, this is the final of our 10 series uh, group of, of webinars that we've been co-hosting between AVP and Suncup. It's been a super exciting uh, run. Um, frankly, I've totally enjoyed it. And we're so glad that many of you have stuck by us through this process, but hopefully we've added some value to you too in the process of uh, you taking time off to be part of this initiative. Um, today is a really exciting uh, webinar as well, where we're talking to the investors to hear their side of the story in terms of what they're doing. And we're, we're glad to have three really good organizations and individuals representing uh, this sector today. And without, without further ado, I'll move on and uh, let them uh, jump on to the next stage. But just to also say thank you to Sankalp. You've been great partners in running this series. Really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to greater things in days to come. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks so much, Frank. Uh, Margaret, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I think we'll just give a, a quick welcome to our speakers. Uh, um, today we have Brian Odiambo from Novastar Ventures. Uh, he is joining us from Lagos. Is that right, Brian? Yes. Uh, and Megan Corin from Acumen, who is also, I think, joining us from, is it, is it Lagos or somewhere West Africa? No, I'm not sure. It, it, yeah, it's usually Lagos uh, in COVID times. Unfortunately, it's New York, but. Okay, yeah. okay. Great, thanks Megan for joining us. And we have uh, Sibo Mavuka who is joining us from South Africa. Um, so a very warm welcome to our speakers and thank you once again for, for joining us today. Uh, Margaret, if you wanna go to the next slide and I think um, George, if you wanna help us uh, launch the poll in, an, in a few minutes. Um, so just to, to give you guys a sense on the agenda, we're gonna have some remarks from our speakers. For those of you who are used to our our format by now, we're gonna try and reserve a good chunk of time for question and answer. So we welcome all of your questions in the chat box. Um, as this is our 10th and final series, we have some, some slightly different uh, ending points today. So we're gonna give a few opportunities uh, for some, some of our audience members to make some comments uh, for those of uh, them who have been with us for quite a long time. Um, and then we're just gonna share some highlights at the very end. Um, so next slide, uh, Margaret. And We'll just launch the first poll. So we want to hear from, from you guys when you think the ecosystem, sort of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the impact ecosystem is going to recover. Um, you know, do you think, I don't know if anyone's gonna say everything is fine, um, but do you think it's gonna happen later this year? Do you think it's not gonna happen till next year, next two to three years, or we're never gonna go back to the way things were before, I think. Um, I think you know the ecosystem might never recover. So, just just put your put your comment in. We'll leave this up for another ten seconds or so. Um, just curious to hear what you guys think as to when when the space will sort of come back to what might be a new normal. Um, so I'll give you maybe another five seconds. Oh, we do have one pe one pessimist. Someone says the ecosystem will never recover. Uh, <laughs> it happens. Okay, cool. So maybe another two seconds and then um, we'll share the poll results. So it looks like we're looking at late 2021 or potentially the next two to three years. Uh, so it looks like we definitely have quite some, some way to go to recover from this. Um, 
So, so I will go ahead and welcome Brian, who will be our first speaker. Um, in, in light of that, Brian uh, from Nova Star would be really interested to sort of hear your thoughts and, and really would be interested to hear your, your sort of perspective also on when, when you all at Nova Star sort of see um, the recovery time frame and, and how resilient the ecosystem will be. Over to you, Brian. Thanks, Ariel. Um, so I'll just run through uh, the slides and, and, and try um, incorporate um, the COVID or how we're thinking about COVID and, and the recovery of the ecosystem. Um, so um, this next slide. So what's the big idea for Novastar? Um, we have set out to catalyze the venture asset class in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and demonstrate basically that we can achieve both social and commercial returns. And I think that's true for a lot of us. Um, we have a thesis that, you know, if we can build companies that are super large, serving the largest market in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a low income mass market or the low middle income market as well, um, we can achieve both um, a venture type of scale. And, and if you think about venture capital in the West, you know, serving the middle market, which is the largest market in that side of the world, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is the mass market. So inevitably to be a venture capitalist in Africa, you'd have to serve you know, the low income mass market. Unfortunately, that's really difficult, but it is, it is possible and we're seeing that as feasible. Um, just move on to the next one. Um, and, and so, you know, how do we do this? We are effectively a multi-stage um, investor um, starting super early, um, you know, and, and that kind of is a seed stage potentially, some, um, sometimes pre-seed even, um, with a couple of hundred thousand dollars um, in and, and with the ability to go up to, um, you know, a, a 10 million actually in our second fund now. Um, you know, looking for innovative businesses, serving, you know, large market, um, either better quality, reduced price, um, or better access to a product that currently is unavailable to the mass market, um, with a view of obviously positioning those assets as um, uh, strategic uh, acquisition opportunities in the future. And so that's really important for us because, again, we are trying to demonstrate the full venture cycle, which means not just deploying the capital and, and showing the growth and the, and, and the impact, but also you know, being able to return that capital at, uh, at multiples that are um, you know, demonstrative of, of kind of venture type returns. And that's kind of the double digit uh, financial scale return that we're talking about there. Um, you can move on to the next one. And this is a little bit of our portfolio here. Um, and, and you know, DJ from Poise here, representing one of our companies. Um, and, and, you know, this is our portfolio across two funds. So we have 15 companies in the first fund. Some of you will recognize some of these. We're co-invested in some of these with, with some people I'm seeing, some names I see here as well. Um, and, and, and three companies in, in, in our second fund. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about kind of our two funds in the next slide. Um, so we raised the uh, Novastar Fund 1 uh, about five and a half years ago. That's an $80 million fund with a $10 million co-investment facility. Uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, multi-round investment strategy, commercial, um, BOP impacts. But I, that fund was largely focused on East Africa and Ethiopia primarily. Um, and actually, April this year, we had the final close of our second fund um, at $108 million. Um, and, and expanded a little bit the scope of that fund to, meet, to, to kind of low income or, or mass market really, broadly speaking, without necessarily having to put a dollar value at, uh, at kind of our target um, customer, the target customer of the companies we invest in. And that's just inevitably to give us the, you know, that's to give us the flexibility to go up market if we see the market evolving in a way that actually um, people who may have higher income are still underserved given just broken infrastructure and broken services in, 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 in the markets that we operate in um, and, and allow us to see, see um, a larger um, portfolio or a, a larger number of pipeline companies. Um, the, other, the other difference is um, that we also then launch in Nigeria and Ghana um, and see Megan there, spend a lot of time in Megan. Um, and uh, 
actually getting us in uh, settling into 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 Nigeria. Um, and uh, now I, you know, I'm I'm I moved here um, to get our office going. We have a, a small team here, um, a, a larger team in Nairobi, and we operate effectively from the two hubs. Um, but the thesis and the, and the approach for both funds is the same, except just an expansion in in the market. Um, let's move on a little bit. Um, and and so you know some of the learnings and some of the things that we've seen um, through this this period. We still believe strongly that our businesses have to be vertically integrated, um, given the operational complexities of, of the markets that they operate in, and just to make sure that they're resilient. And, and during COVID, I think our, our companies that have done well and so really survived are the companies that owned different aspects of their value chain. They didn't, hadn't outsourced logistics to a company that's actually just focused on that today and actually is going to suffer because of COVID. And maybe logistics is not the right example, but you know what I mean? You know, if you can build different aspects of, of, of the value chain that you operate in as much as you can and control that, as much as it is more capital, it is capital intensive. And, you know, we are structured to back capital intensive businesses at this stage. Um, you know, so we're not nervous about that as a venture investor, which is a little bit atypical of other venture funds. Um, so we we love we love vertical integration. Um, we've seen those companies be a lot more resilient right now. Um, I think the fact that we're serving we're 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 backing companies that are serving the mass market effectively means that we're backing companies that are providing an essential serv essential need or a really basic good or service. And effectively, those have been categorized as essential services. And so we've seen either just a flattening of of growth, which is fine actually as, a, as an outcome in this period, or in some cases, you know, thinking about M Pharma here, um, or even poor um, in, 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 in this time have both seen kind of really increased growth during this period because of just the, the increasing demand for their services and the, the ability for them to be a little bit more opportunistic. Um, other, other things, uh, you know, that we've, we've, we've continued to see obviously um, during this period is uh the lack of the, the the talent gaps that you know our companies continue to have to fill and and, and suffer from and and that's a, and, and a, you know a pain that's teething and, and keeps going and during this period when you know you've had to really bring people together and 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 um put a lot of heads together to figure out how to work through this period um and we just seen gaps in, in, in our teams and, and the need for more talent really so that our CEOs and our C-suite founders are not all bearing the brunt of having to work through the, the, the COVID um, period. Um, I'll move on quickly to the next one. Um, uh, I was asked to, to, to talk about what things we need help with. And, and, and so broadly speaking, these are the three things I could think of. Um, if anyone knows how to solve regulation, that would be great. Um, our companies, as I said, are typically operating in, in spaces where uh, the government should be providing the service in other markets or a big part of those services that we, we our companies are providing. And so they are public goods, they are public services, they are, get, they are easily politicized, they are um, they come under scrutiny of unions and, and so on. And so we we, we suffer a lot of pushback um, from the regulator in that sense. We also suffer a lot of pushback because we are innovating and we are kind of staying, staying at the cutting edge of things, right, of industry. And so we, 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 if, we, if someone has a solution to that, I need help with that. That would be great. Um, obviously, talent de development would be great as well. And, and, and broadly speaking, you know, and I think Sankop is, is doing a great job on this as well, is just access to information for entrepreneurs and and really trying to shorten the learning curve when it comes to learning um, how to seek investment and how to talk to investors. I know there's a, it seems like there's a lot that has been done, but even today we're still encountering entrepreneurs who we still have to do a little bit of education and handholding before we can actually get a deal done, which just takes longer um, and, and is, you know, sometimes actually results in the deal getting lost. Um, I'll stop there. Um, I know that's quite a bit in, 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 in a short time, but I'm obviously happy to take questions later on and um, answer some questions in the chat as well. Thanks.
Great, thank you so much, Brian. And yes, if anyone has any questions for Brian, feel free to just put them in the chat. We'll come back to them um, after we hear from our other speakers. Um, so the next speaker I would like to, to welcome up is Megan Corin with uh, Acumen. And we'll pull your slides up. And Megan, over to you. Great, thanks so much. Um, it's great to be here today, uh, and I think to I'll share a little bit about Acumen's model for those of you who are unfamiliar. Two specific relief initiatives we've undertaken, and how we're thinking about that two to three year time frame that uh, that folks responded to in the poll. Um, Margaret, if you could go to the next slide. Um, before I get into the relief facilities, for those who aren't familiar, just wanted to give a brief introduction to Acumen and our investing model. So Acumen is structured as a nonprofit and we use philanthropic capital or grants that come to Acumen to turn around and then make equity investments um, in early stage social enterprises. Uh, our tickets usually are from 300,000 to 700, $150,000 um, in a seed or series A with a capacity for follow-on as the companies grow and scale. Um, but what makes our model unique is that the returns generated from our portfolio in you know that right-hand circle rather than going back to investors are put back into our own um, fund, if you will, or pool of capital ploy the same uh, the same capital and that multiplies the impact for the donor who made a grant to Acumen um, and really enables us to kind of continue almost in, in an evergreen sense in terms of deploying capital um, to different enterprises more oh you could stay on that side sorry thanks um, but more importantly what this enables us to do is for the companies that we are investing in we have a more flexible time horizon um, than a closed-end fund so recognizing that for small companies in operating environments most of whom are explicitly trying to serve low-income customers we recognize that reaching scale can take time. Um, and so not having a closed end timeline for the fund enables us a little bit more flexibility to accompany uh, these enterprises on that path to scale on whatever that, that timeline might be. The second and more important thing about um, using philanthropic capital to make our investments is that enables us to maintain a strong impact first lens as the company prepares to scale um, and i wouldn't you know we're also seeking for companies to achieve impact and have uh financial sustainability and financial returns but we're not forced to pursue growth at all costs or uh really pressurized short-term growth in favor of uh, you know investor returns because anything that we that comes back to us goes back into the pool um, in West Africa we've deployed around 10 million dollars in nine companies um, and I'll come back around to talking a little bit more about this model at the end but just wanted to set that context uh, before we go to the next slide I want to also mention that in addition to its role as an investor um, Acumen also recognized that social entrepreneurs alone are not going to tackle problems of inequality. We know that these entrepreneurs exist within larger ecosystems that require government, the private sector, NGOs um, to all orient themselves uh, on measuring success, not only how the elite fare, but how the most vulnerable are treated. And so with that in mind, we launched the Acumen Fellows Program which we brought to West Africa in 2018. And the Fellows Program brings individuals from across different stakeholder groups, um, many earlier stage entrepreneurs than what we would normally invest in, um, but also individuals leading NGOs, working in government. And these individuals are working on the same issues that we look at in our portfolio, um, renewable energy, agriculture, healthcare, and then some are more broad, like human rights. Um, and so 
that program, that Acumen Fellows program is a leadership development program um, and is really focused on enhancing the capacity of those individuals and, and their capacity to influence and drive change. But um, it's also an interesting way for us to have a view at some earlier stage pipeline as you know what we might look to invest in in, in a couple of years down the road. Um, so that's acumen in normal times. Margaret, if you could pass to the next slide. Uh, with the onset of COVID-19, um, Acumen's global team came together with some of our core funders to support our global portfolio and community of fellows. Um, we were hearing across the board, but especially from our fellows who tended to run earlier stage ventures than our investees, um, just how fragile things became really quickly. They had less cash on hand and just overall less infrastructure to be able to withstand, you know, what for some was a, a complete drop off in revenue, what for others was, you know, uh, quantum leaps in operational expenses. And so we raised, um, uh, just over $4 million to deploy globally. Um, and about 400,000 of that has gone into 10 companies and actually three nonprofits in West Africa. As we did this, we structured this emergency facility as grants. And for Acumen, this was a huge leap of faith and a big shift because we've spent a lot of time over the last 15 years um, getting folks to understand that even though we're impact first and we use philanthropic capital, that we act like any other equity investor in terms of our relationship with the company. And yet we felt that, you know, COVID was unprecedented in intensity, in scale, and as we're understanding now in the duration of the pressure that it was putting on these um, early stage businesses and felt that you know, this was an appropriate time to break that rule. Um, we also used it as a moment to reinvent our capacity for speed. Uh, and I think if you talk to any entrepreneur, I've seen a number of entrepreneurs um, dialed in here today, they'll, uh, it's easy to get them talking about the frustrations of how slow moving some institutional investors can be. Um, and Acumen is not exempt from that as we've worked on you know, our own diligence and documentation processes and are continually trying to see how we can lighten the burden on investees while maintaining the rigor and discipline um, that we need as investors. But again, in this instance, uh, didn't wanna get lost in the paperwork and the diligence and making this onerous on companies that already were facing myriad challenges. And so it's a, two-page application and we asked for their prior year financials, um, spent some time with each of the entrepreneurs, you know, understanding. For our portfolio companies, obviously we know the businesses really well, we've been working with them for years, um, but for the fellows, because we'd only interacted with them in, in capacity as, uh, you know, on their individual development, that that is all that was left. Um, Sorry, I, I just realized I have only a little bit of time left. So I wanna go to the next slide um, because what we learned from doing this for Acumen's own portfolio was that, you know, after taking care of our own, we began to consider what longer term recovery for the ecosystem would look like. And I was kind of haunted by the idea um, in the IIF, the Impact Investors Foundation report from last year, um, mentioned that quality pipeline of investment ready companies is an ongoing challenge in West Africa. And what would happen if all of these companies who didn't yet have institutional funders on board were facing some of the same challenges? And what would that mean for our investable pipeline as we look two and three years out if they were to kind of fall into the abyss of COVID? So with Ventures Platform and with some brain power from Brian at Novastar, um, uh, Ventures Platform is an accelerator and early stage investor, and we came together with them to design the Nigeria Impact Startup Relief Facility. And so mirroring the structure of Acumen's global facility, this is our contribution to the ecosystem where we're inviting other investors to come together, pool capital, 
um, and then jointly make some decisions about high potential pipeline that we see that are companies that might be earlier than what we would normally invest in, but who we want to support with some concessionary capital through um, through this chapter of COVID so that when we look two and three years out, there's still a healthy pipeline for us and other impact investors to choose from in terms of making investments. Um, but I'll stop there uh, just to be mindful of time and, and can take questions or comments uh, later on. Thanks. Fantastic. Megan, thank you so much. And th thanks once again. Megan is, is usually based in Lagos, but she is, I think, joining us from New York and it's got to be like 4 a.m. So, <laughs> so thank you for being up so early to join us. Um, and thanks so much for sharing your insights. If anyone has questions uh, for Megan, please do put them into the chat box and we'll come back to them in a minute. Um, for now, I just wanted to take a pause before we get to the next presentation to take one more uh, poll from your perspective. Uh, so George, if we can go ahead and launch the poll. What we want to know uh, from you guys is what you think um, can be done to help accelerate the ecosystem, um, the recovery of the ecosystem a bit faster. Um, so, you know, is there any way you think that we could reduce that timeline from a two to three year recovery um, to make that actual timeline crunched a bit shorter? So is it is it additional bridge financing for, for ecosystem players and for entrepreneurs? Um, is it supporting, you know, providing additional to support to the entrepreneur support organization? So the advisory firms and the capacity builders and the incubators. Um, is it, you know, ramping up government support? Um, is it, you know, providing additional or improved networks for investment and philanthropy? Um, is it, you know, increasing awareness for government so that we can increase policy? Is it, you know, more flexible work in business environments? Uh, and is it, to, to one of Brian's points, you know, is it, is it the need for more support in terms of talent and upskilling? So I will give the poll another uh, maybe 10 seconds or so. Um, it looks like there's, there seems to be a clear front runner, but I don't want to bias anyone. Uh, so I'll give it another two seconds or so. Um, and then George, we can stop and share share the results um, um get in your yes yeah, sorry I'm, I'm just giving it maybe another five seconds just for anyone who hasn't clicked anything um okay. <laughs> just because it's multiple choice um so i'm closing it in another three seconds and we are, should be done all right i will so, share the results now on the screen so it looks like money is <laughs> cash is king uh looks like bridge financing and gap financing um is is most needed so the only thing that that seems like that's going to get us out of this is is more money and interestingly networks uh seem to be uh the sort of the second option so i think sort of speaking to again some of brian's points uh around you know improving access to information and networks for the for the ecosystem is really important. Um, so thanks so much for that, George. Uh, Margaret, if you want to go to the next slide, and I will call up our next speaker, Sibo, who is joining us from South Africa. I hope uh, I hope the power is still stable, Sibo. We still have you with us. It is. Yes, yes, yes. No. Load shedding has been Wonderful. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, morning, everyone. So just a bit about Chikululu. Um, so we are a social impact fund manager. So we manage a lot of corporate foundations on behalf of our clients, as well as providing advisory services in the foundation space, as well as the impact investing space. So commercial fund managers are now moving into impact investing. We've seen a whole lot of growth in South Africa. And because we've already been sitting in the social impact space, it made sense for us to actually um, then jump into the IMM space as well and provide those services. So that's who we are. We're probably the largest um, company of our kind in South Africa with about 70 employees and we distribute around 700 million rand every year. Uh, most of our funding is in the form of grants and concessionary financing and impact investing space. So that's guarantee schemes um, as well as um, funding into social impact bonds as well. Next slide. So in terms of what we're doing under the COVID-19, I think one of the more uh, innovative things that we've come up with, or an area that, let me not say innovative per se, but an area that we haven't actually worked in a lot as Chikulu and we saw a gap in was the South African screen sector. So the South African screen sector in South Africa 
is um, a contributor towards GDP of about 4.4 billion rand um, directly and indirectly about 12 billion rand. So we've come together with an international consultancy based in Washington to actually set up the Screen Sector Fund for support. We know with COVID-19 coming on board or the pandemic coming on board, we've seen a whole lot of productions actually pause or being stopped completely, or some of them being reduced in terms of the people that are working in the sector. Um, so there's a lot of independent consultants that work there, who run their own businesses, and they have seen a huge reduction in revenues and a huge, or some of them actually have stopped seeing anything um, in terms of uh, money coming in, into their businesses. So we've set up this fund and are actually going around internationally looking for funders to assist in cushioning the blow to the sector. So, so um, as of last week, we've actually closed the first 500 thousand US dollars, um, which came from one of the big media and, and film production houses in, in the US, um, in the donor community. So we're also looking to probably increase that to about two, 2.5 million US dollars in order to provide those services to the sector. But this is a sector that's been neglected in all ways, um, particularly from the philanthropy part or the foundation part in South Africa. Um, I don't think it's seen as developmental enough um, for people working in the space. Um, next slide. So in relation to other programs that we're running in the social investment space, this is just some of our clients, but we have a number of clients. I think the most um, well-known here for those who come from South Africa is probably the Solidarity Fund, although it's the youngest. Um, but we do have a number of other corporate clients who are working in um, COVID in, in, in trying to assist in the COVID response in South Africa. So we've put a lot of money towards education. Um, this is in the form of testing, in the form of providing um, PPE to the sector, in the form of actually um, providing awareness in the education sector, because we know in South Africa we've actually opened up some of the schools, um, the schooling sector, and it, it actually is providing quite a huge risk towards children and the teachers that are there. And also remembering that the workforce of South Africa, those are their kids, so it's a, it affects them as well. So in the health sector, we've come across um, a whole lot of need in terms of the medicines that are required for COVID-19, equipment, um, PPE as well for the nursing staff. We've seen strikes in certain areas where people are, strikes in certain areas where people are actually requiring assistance from a health sector perspective. We know sanitation and water, a huge problem in other areas, especially developing communities in South Africa. So we've put a lot of money towards that. Livelihoods in terms of agriculture with people losing jobs, there's a whole lot of land that's available in rural areas. So we've put a lot of programs around agriculture and being able to actually go into subsistence farming for those situated there. And then technical assistance, Chikulu's got a platform that provides um, grant management, that provides um, m and &E services, that provides um, advisory services. So we've actually been able to um, um, assist certain organizations in terms of the technical assistance who might have not been well positioned to respond to the 19 at the time. So that is an area that we've also gone into. In certain cases, we've been able to provide this pro bono as well. So as our contribution as a company towards the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. So in terms of the top six lessons um, for social investors in COVID-19, from our experience in Chikululu, it's avoiding the knee-jerk um, syndrome. We know that a lot of people would like to assist in, 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 in COVID-19, but we do say to the people that we work with that you need to have this thought out properly before you actually go into it. It is a noble cause, but you need to actually still be able to think and provide for um, data and monitoring once you've put that money into the sector. Um, also the time for partnerships. We know that in terms of partnerships, um, we as the social investors are under pressure, but you can imagine that those who are working in the actual communities are actually more under pressure. So it's important for social investors who are requiring the ME data, who are requiring reports, and who are requiring delivery from these organizations to actually keep that in mind at all times, that the pressure is not just on yourselves, but also on the organizations and become true partners in assisting them in dealing with what they, they are facing on the ground. And then engagement with governments. In South Africa, we know that government is running a number of programs from the Solidarity Fund to programs that are, that are looking at business sector. 
in particular, as well as the health sector. Um, so it's important for us as social investors to also co coordinate our spending with governments or partner with government, speak to government, speak to government in the way that uh, we are doing our business or in the way that we're deploying our capital. Next slide. Um, so don't let perfection be the enemy of good. We know that there's a lot of duplication. It is a time of a pandemic, so people are spending on the same thing. Let that not stop you from putting money into that. It might be duplication, but it's duplication in other areas as well. Um, so in areas in the country, so what Chikunula has done in order to assist in avoiding that actually is actually getting, money, um, getting data from entrepreneurs, from social investors around South Africa to actually say, what are they doing towards the COVID-19 um, 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 pandemic? So this is able to map the, the sectors, map the areas, and to know that these are the areas where the space is within um, the investment. So, and also every bean count, every bit counts. So we know that even without the pandemic, resources are quite scarce um, in the social investment space, and especially in the development space. There's not enough money, whether you talk to government, whether you talk to social investors or corporate foundations, there's not enough money for us to be able to solve all the social problems in South Africa. So that is one of the areas that you need to understand how do you better and efficiently actually deploy capital. And then don't forget the auditors. So we know it's a time of pandemic, people are just spending like crazy and spending money, but remember that there's governance that still needs to be adhered to and don't find yourself in trouble when audit time comes after the pandemic has actually um, subsided. Um, next slide. I'll try to be quick. I know I'm out of time. So in terms of the post-COVID-19 tips for social investment, Chikolulu had a scenario planning. COVID-19 has come with a whole lot of financial strains of foundations. So it's important to actually do scenario planning for 12, um, 24 to 48 months, actually around how the cash flow, and this is, should be done with the business if you're a corporate foundation. Stay flexible. We know that people have strategies in place and they've got set sectors and areas in which they are investing in as, as companies, as funds, as foundations. So it's important to be flexible because we're sitting in uncertain times as um, a population. And then the broader impact and all that you do, make sure that you broaden an impact, foster resilience, it's important to become innovative in the way that we structure the programs that we are introducing into the sector. And that's fostering the resilience is a very important thing, even beyond um, COVID-19, let's say in the two years in recovery. Be patient. We're not going to see results immediately. Finding documents. We know that finding documents are strict in what you can and cannot do, but make sure that you're able to go back and change that. This also speaks to the point of pointers, because once the finding documents say something else and you're spending on one other thing, that might be a problem from the master's office or from the auditor's data. Data is one of the most important things to be able to report what you are doing. And because we know that, particularly in South Africa, many of them are actually public benefits organizations, which makes it important for you to actually report to the rest of South Africa on what you're doing and how you're spending that money. And then also remembering inclusion, innovative monitoring and evaluation. Um, because of the lockdown and people not being able to go on the ground, we need to find innovative ways in which to do our m and &E. um, And then documents and learning. Um, it's important to document all the learnings that you guys are making, that you guys are actually getting out of this work that you're doing um, under the COVID-19 crisis in case we come across another pandemic that might come in the future. And that's it. That's where I'm stopping. The rest of the slides are just about Chikulubu. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sibyl. Really appreciate the very practical advice and, and sort of imperative that you, you are mentioning around alignment and, you know, being very intentional about how, how to spend this money um, for, for impact investors and social investors. So thank you so much. Um, and, and if anyone has any additional questions for Sibyl, please do put them in in the chat. Um, I will come back to, to Brian first. There were a couple of questions that came in for you. Um, one of the questions, Brian, was sort of based on your portfolio of companies, the question was, what sort of additional capital needs um, have you seen in this period? And what's, you know, what's the sort of 
amount of, of additional capital that's needed, I guess, and sort of, and, and we saw from the poll that bridge financing um, seems to be really important for the recovery of the space. Um, so just wondering if you can speak to that and, and share some insights from, specifically from your portfolio on what, what that's looking like in terms of yeah. need. Thanks, Ariel. Um, we, we've seen a lot of need, right? I think the companies that have been, so there's two ways to think about it. There's companies that had just raised capital and they were fine. They had raised the capital to grow. So instead of growing, they're just going to use the capital to kind of coast and, 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 and kind of um, uh, weather the storm. So those companies are okay from a liquidity perspective. The problem is they're not okay from a growth perspective. So at the end of the period, when they go out to market, the investors will still ask, so what's changed, right? I mean, apart from the fact that you had money in the bank and so you didn't tank during COVID, you know, there's, there's actually no, no improvement in KPIs necessarily. And so, you, you know, there's a, there's a bet to be made or, or I guess some, a conversation to be had about whether investors will place pre premium on companies that actually just survive or actually will say, you know, we still need to see a little bit of growth. So that's, that's kind of one. We have a few companies that look like that. Then we have a, a bunch and maybe half or so of our portfolio that actually did need bridge financing. And, and largely because, you know, they need to um, compensate for lost revenue. Um, and that's even after cutting costs, right? Um, what, what we've found, you know, and that is anywhere from half, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to maybe two million on the top side. Um, but what we found is really most, most important during this period is not just the capital, but the, the, the nature, the instrument that you use for that capital. So traditionally, we equity investors, and that's how we think that we realize the most value long term and we get a return on our capital. But during this period, we've had to be comfortable with doing convertible notes, for example, and just structuring those in a way that isn't punitive and, and kind of vulture capital necessarily but also that tries to meet somewhere between not being debt provider because we are not debt providers but also not being a complete kind of you know just vulture trying to really build in punitive um, terms in the convertible so i think if, if i had to pick one thing that's really outstanding during this period is having a convertible as an instrument because a of uncertainty of pricing during this period and b because of the need for speed right so we need to move quickly and we can't spend five months negotiating for legal. So we need, we need something faster. And so that's, that's how we've managed and, and we've used our capital. We've raised side, fund, side, 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 side cars from our LPs to also deploy in, 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 the, in the portfolio. We've gone to our LPs and got some tier funding. So we have tier funding as well to try, you know, we've, we've gone everywhere <laughs> um, to, to try to find money to, to support our companies during this period. Great. Great, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Brian. And Megan, I think I'll come to you picking up uh, a question from the chat and some of the comments that, that Brian made sort of on this growth versus survival, right? Um, so Frank has asked, you know, do you think the ecosystem has hampered the business case for impact investing? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I'll, 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 he sort of added a qualifier that, that if, if so, then what really needs to do to sort of course correct that. But I think Brian makes a really good point on if, if you're, you know, the investors are expecting a return and those businesses need to grow in order to do that, are investors going to be okay to, to ride this out for survival and, and not losing cash? Um, you know, so overall, what, what do you see this is doing to the impact investing space at, at large and the reputation of impact investing globally? Yeah, thanks, Ariel. Um, and, and what Brian shared resonates a lot with some of the patterns we experienced across our portfolio as well. Um, I, you know, I, I think in many ways, this moment is going to show us um, how serious different impact investors are about impact and not to say completely at the expense of returns, but this is a moment where if you're going to continue to insist on the same growth trajectory that you had planned 12 months ago, um, you, you know, you're, you're asking the impossible. And so how can impact investors, you know, think more flexibly, uh, 
be more flexible about their instruments or the time horizons of the expectations that they had set with companies to hit certain milestones um, because so much has changed and you know the the playbook from yesterday is not going to work in in today's world and i think the the flexibility um, and willingness of impact investors to shift in ways that enable these companies to succeed over the longer term is really where the rubber is going to meet the road. We've seen it with our portfolio with some of their lenders, um, you know, who's willing to adjust timelines for principal repayments or, you know, and, and who's kind of sticking it to them as if as if this were, you know, a normal Thursday. Um, and, and I think that is really what's going to make the difference. But I think overall, to the core of Frank's question, um, you know, in to my mind, it enhances the case for impact investing, um, and maybe in particular, some more concessionary capital to come in, because these are such extraordinary times and it's going to require a little bit more of that patience and flexibility to accompany these enterprises on the path to scale thanks thanks so much megan and i see that's that's resonating with i think some of the the conversation that's going on in the chat too around around patients through this time. Um, Sibo, I'll, I'll come to you because I know uh, Shiku looks at both, you know, grant and impact investing and, and sort of picking up on some of the comments that Megan just made about maybe some concessionary capital being needed now. Um, what um, What is your perspective on, on sort Hello? of the type of, oh, sorry, can Hello? you hear me now? Hi, sorry, can you hear me now, Sibo? um hi sorry i'm back yeah. sorry okay great great you can hear me yeah i can hear you now I can hear super. You. super um so just picking up from you know megan actually just made the comment that maybe some concessionary capital is needed in addition to you know your traditional impact investments uh and i know Shikululu sort of looks at both grants and impact investment um and and you sort of mentioned the knee-jerk reaction in your in your you know presentation just sort of wondering where what is the form of capital that you see most critical right now for the ecosystem to recover is it grants is that having is that going to have negative long-term effects is it commercial capital is it both um i think it's for for me it's both so one of the areas where we see a need, we know that in terms of riskiness of um, SME sector, how they are seen, they're really risky without this COVID-19 issue, but now with COVID-19, it's actually accentuated that kind of risk that is seen um, amongst the financial institutions of people who are putting money into the sector. So it will be important for those who can be able to provide concessionary finance in, this, in, the, in the form of, for instance, a guarantee scheme to be able to open up more money into the sector. Um, one of the areas that Chikulula has been involved in is actually the guarantee scheme for loans. And we've seen that uh, a mere 20 million rand is able to provide 200 million rand in loans. So it's a one to 10 kind of ratio that we're able to look at. But also from the grants, grants are very important, um, even in the sector. Um, might not be directly to SMEs, but in order to strengthen the ecosystem in which they play in. Um, so the organizations that are providing business support to the SMEs or business rescue services to the SMEs should be able to work during this time as well. So I think concessionary funding is actually quite important. There's also the issue of blended finance. Uh, we know that already SMEs, as I mentioned, it's quite, they're not very palatable in terms of the risk return ratio. But with COVID-19 making it worse, if we can bring um, blended finance transactions into play where we're able to reduce the amount of interest, for instance, that they're playing on a loan, we should be able to do that to make it more palatable for funders to put money into the sector. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Sibo. Um, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit from the financing perspective. Brian, to come back to you, one of the challenges that you had mentioned was around, uh, you know, regulation. And there's been a couple of questions that that came in on this. Um, uh, and Frank is asking, what what specifically are the regulatory challenges that are hampering, you know, Nova Star's ability to sort of deploy deploy investment? Um, and you know, is is any 
any particular country on the continent doing well in this regard? I mean, I know you're Kenyan, now you're at, you've set up Nova Stars West Africa office, so I know you have a really good regional perspective. Um, so sort of would be yeah. curious to hear about that. And, and we, we have a good diverse set of folks on the call, so somebody might be able to help you out with that. <laughs> yeah, I'll try not to say anything negative about any specific place. Um, like I think across across the uh, spectrum, across different regions, what we've seen is, as I alluded to earlier, when our companies begin to challenge the status quo, right, the regulator either doesn't understand it and therefore doesn't know how to enable it and typically just ends up, because, because they do nothing, not because of what, of what they're doing, we're not able to progress. So you know, because we're not able to get the right licensing or the right, um, I don't know, certification for something, we're not able to move on to the next stage, right? Um, and, and so in that case, there's a little bit of education that is required. Um, and then, you know, going through whatever the bureaucratic tape it takes to, to actually get a certification, right? So I'm thinking about our company Green Path in, 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 um, in Ethiopia, they, because the regulator required that they grow certain seeds or plants that are on a pre-approved list that was updated like 15 years ago, um, Greenpath is not able to bring new technology to the company, to, to the country because updating that list requires you to do like 20 different things and takes, and you know, two years later, we're still updating that list. Um, Right, and that and that's that, that's, a, that's a huge thing for the business because they can't you know stay on top of things and compete with other global companies, especially when they're selling in markets where their competitors are also selling, and they need to keep up. On the flip side, um, it's like education, where it's not so much that the you know the the regulator themselves um, is blocking us from progressing, but through, uh, through unions or kind of organized groups, like let me say the teachers union, for example, with Bridge, where we know that our, the business that we invest in is demonstrating better outcomes than the government funded version of that thing. And so the people who are paid to do the government funded version of that thing and are unionized, um, you know, challenge or, or you know, build a campaign or, or carry out a campaign against our, our investees. And so you know, and, and that's typically driven through the regulator because that's really where you cut it off, right? Like when you go to the president of a country and say, this company is doing, is teaching our kids homosexuality, right? And, and, and in Uganda, that's a big deal, right? Uh, um, and so the president is like, okay, shut it down today <laughs> because I, I, you know, what is going on here? And then, you know, we do the, we do the work and we realize, first of all, you know, that's not the worst thing. But secondly, that's not what we're doing. Yeah, and but then to un unwind all of the damage that has been done already takes a long time. So, so we've seen where we're challenging the status quo. The regulators in, is, is is incorporated into into the conversation and typically blocks because they're trying to again remain clean and appeal to the to the voter ultimately. Um, but again, we've found that the voter and the customer in our case is, is the best champion for our companies and a, com a country that's doing really well. I think most of us will agree is Rwanda in my perspective um you know you know they 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 have a really enabling environment and we've been able to expand and go into that market quite well um um because of just once you there is a bureaucracy but once you get approval for something to happen it happens without question which is great um obviously for us um but that's that's kind of how we're thinking about regulation generally it's not it's, and this is true. It's going to be true across um, fintech, across education, across healthcare, across anything that's cutting edge and, and new. Great, great. Thanks for that, Brian. And it's really interesting to hear that, that the biggest advocates for you on this are your actual customers of, of your companies themselves. That was really interesting. Uh, Megan Siebel just wanted to to let you kind of either of you weigh in on this. Um, do either of you have, have you had any experience in engaging with regulators? Um, or, or are you sort of seeing the same, same constraints uh, that, that, that Brian mentioned here? Um, from our side in South Africa, 
So because a number of foundations are registered as public benefit organizations, there's a huge amount of regulation that um, comes with that because of the tax breaks that you get as a foundation or as a corporate putting money into the foundation. So that limits the amount of work that you can do within, the, for instance, the SME sector or limits the amount of work that you can also do in the um, impact investing sector as well. So for instance, on a social impact bond, if you're a PBO, you can only be an outcomes funder. You can't be an investor in the impact bond. So those are issues that we run into as Chikulu. So we've been pushing for regulation to change, especially with impact investing becoming a new thing. Um, through the impact investing in South Africa forums, we do have a, a, a subcommittee that just looks at regulation and how do we then um, advance the regulation in South Africa from a SARS perspective, which is our receiver of revenue in terms of taxes, as well as government regulation in more general and broad terms, as well as how foundations could work in that. So that's one thing that we grapple with every single day, especially trying to move into um, the impact investing space. Great, great, thanks. And there's been a really interesting comment slash question that, that came in from, from Johan. Um, and, and he's saying that it seems like the larger entities tend to, to get sort of first in line for the government support um, that, that is available in terms of bailouts and tenders. Um, and so the question is sort of what, what can be done to support the smaller SMEs? And I think, um, I mean, maybe Megan, or, or since maybe it's it's your turn. Um, I, I know you mentioned that you've you know you've invested about what ten million dollars into nine nine companies. So those are f fairly substantial um, entrepreneurs uh, and fairly substantially you know mm -hmm. sophisticated businesses. Do you have any any sort of responses on on the thought to this question of of what really can be done? to support those smaller enterprises, because when we look at the pipeline, right, those smaller enterprises need to grow so that they can reach a stage where the Acumens and yeah. the Nova Stars could invest. Um, so what do you think needs to be done in terms of that? Yeah, I think that that's part of uh, why the work we've done with our relief facility and working with our fellows, looking at their businesses and not just at their leadership capacity has been huge, hugely instructional for us. I mean, one short answer is that part of how we think of the fellowship is a way to share acumen social capital with much smaller SMEs or nonprofits or civil society organizations that don't always have access to platforms or um, different relationships that we might be able, you know, introductions and networks we might be able to introduce them to. But more concretely, when it comes to will they be raising investment capital, um, we've gotten a much better sense for what some of those gaps are. Um, and, and a lot of it is things you may have been able to predict, but part of their inability to win, um, you know, tenders or, or even qualify for investment from other institutional funders is connected to their, you know, capacity to tell the story coherently, to um, manage their finances, understand what kind of capital they need now, what kind of capital they're going to need longer term, um, and really be able to, to lay out the the projections for the business and otherwise there I think it all gets wrapped up into this investment readiness piece but a lot of that um, seems to be concentrated around uh, strategic finance and so thinking about how we can support them more you know a, a number of them even as enterprises uh, are managing grants to do one part of the business and then have revenue coming in over here and tying it all together to in a coherent story where you can see that they're on a path to sustainability as an enterprise is um, is something we've been working with with a handful of them on. Great, great, thanks, Megan. And um, that's we sort of keep coming back to the role of grants uh, in this space, uh, which is really interesting. And, and I think we all recognize that it has a really big role to play, as particularly on the African continent. Um, and you know, Frank asks that. Um, oh, where did it go? Uh, sorry, so you know, th there's been mention of a lot of this need for concessionary capital, and I mean, I'll 
whoever of you want to take this question, I, I would leave it, but um, do you think that those, the holders of that grant capital really understand their sort of innovative financing role and, and that critical role that they have to play in, you know, in, in unlocking that private capital that, that you mentioned, Megan, right? It's sort yeah. of getting the grants uh, and heading that towards that sustainability um, yeah. angle. But do the actual grant providers, do you think they really understand their role in the ecosystem? Um, and, and obviously that's changing right now with, with the, the pandemic. Right. Um, so yeah, Megan, if you want to answer that, Brian, Sibo, uh, anybody who's welcome, who yeah. wants to share their thoughts on that. I'll take a stab and then invite the others to join in. I was hoping we would come to that question. Because um, I think even as we talk about concessionary, there are a couple layers of that. So, so the most concessionary is obviously grant capital. Acumen also considers itself concessionary in that we're not seeking market rate returns. We're hoping to you know, recover the value of the investment that we initially make. Um, but we're not necessarily trying to maximize. Um, and so that that has a concessionary element as well. What I think has happened maybe over the last five years is that as more and more um, impact investors have come into this space pursuing both financial and social returns, um, the case for concessionary capital has has gone away because someone would look at Novastar and say, hey, if I can put my capital here and get my returns, why would I, you know, wor work through acumen and do it in a concessionary way? And so I think actually, like at the LP and investor level, it's become more challenging to make the case for that concessionary capital as the thrust for attracting private capital. Um, and that that focus has really come into play. But but Brian and I would also look at different companies. Um, and there are things that he would invest in that we would say are not a fit for acumen and vice versa. Um, and so how do we continue to maintain sort of the continuum or the capital spectrum that you know starts with grants for the earliest stages, um, uh, moves you know into this concessionary middle, and then has the growth capital and the private sector capital for companies that have really matured and are able to be taken to scale. I just think we've we've lost a little bit of of sort of the layout of of that continuum um, as the impact space has become more crowded and I'm curious to see how COVID will or will not influence or shift that um, either in terms of bringing more concessionary or otherwise. Some of the grants that we see like our fellows companies working with are um, you know, driven by development agencies and they're large scale like project oriented grants and that has a disruptive element in that they're not even necessarily as grantors interested in the long-term financial sustainability of the enterprise. For them, it's like an implementing partner. And so I think there's also a distinction between grant capital that's intended to seed a business and an enterprise that will eventually sustain itself and grant capital that's project based and you're you know you're looking for the most capable set of hands to get a, a specific piece of work done but that confusion um, I think trips up some of the enterprises and again is is kind of another layer in this capital continuum great great thanks for that Megan uh, Brian Sibo do either of you want to comment on this sure um, Look, I think I think for us, we we have perhaps more than ever seen the need for grant capital during this period. It's kind of been pronounced, really, in a way that we definitely did not appreciate before. You know, we've we've always had a technical assistance facility, and by and large, that's structured as as a grant making um, envelope of cash to our companies, though not to our com companies outside the Novus portfolio. Um, and that's been very helpful and, and, and useful in kind of funding things that are non-core to businesses and so on. But during this time, you know, we we definitely were looking at, at other opportunities for grant funding. What what ended up happening is a lot of grant um, offering organizations were either looking for the more mature businesses where 
the impact could be multiplied in a very you know obvious way so it's not so much as a seed fund like get going and let's see how it goes it's more you've been doing this for a long time um let me help you do it you know three times bigger or something like that and 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 specifically our healthcare businesses that you'd expect were probably a lot better place to receive funding we managed to convince one of our lps to try to think a little bit more creatively about how companies that perhaps are not necessarily addressing covid head on but may have been affected by COVID could use some of their grant offerings to mitigate or, 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 or kind of um, cover some of the losses um, resulting from COVID, but that, that was a lot more difficult than we expected. And then the, the other thing is, you know, grant funders do not adapt their process to COVID largely, to be honest. So it's the same, it's the same you know, five page, 10 page application, same process of, of going through um, the large donor agencies that Megan was, was talking about. So again, because the small organizations were already eliminated before because donors just stopped giving grants to smaller grant giving organizations, at least in the markets we operate in, we could only go directly to FMO or to CDC or to USAID or something bigger and, and then start having to go through the loopholes um, or, or the bureaucratic kind of red tape. And, and that just became not useful for us. And so it was actually faster for us to go to an investor and say, can you set up a sidecar facility that can invest alongside us um, in commercial instruments, um, but consensual rates, obviously, let's say, you know, much lower convertible debt rates than we would normally do, or much, you know, larger, longer grace periods and stuff like that. So we, we are beginning to think a little bit less commercial, um, but bringing in people who perhaps can take can take that risk because as a fund we unfortunately can't given the, the, our economics and so on um, and getting them to be somewhere between a commercial investor and a grant provider um, but you know I think I think there's an opportunity for grant funders I, I just think it, uh, there's probably need for a little bit of an overhaul um, of how and I'm, I'm sure we've been saying this for years so maybe it's just preaching to the choir at this point Thanks, Brett. Well, maybe this pandemic has sort of given the kick in the pants that we, we need. And I think your, your point around the ability to be nimble and adaptable, I, I think, is, is really important. So, you know, if I go back to Frank's question, it's not just do they understand the role, but, but how can they actually be deploying, deploying their capital effectively? And I, and I think you're speaking to that very well. Uh, Sibo, do you want to share any last comments around uh, around this and the the sort of role that that grant makers have to play and and their ability to to provide that concessionary capital that's really needed right now? Um, yeah, so um, I can speak mostly from the South African perspective. Um, many of the corporate funders that we or corporate foundation funders that we have interacted with don't understand this impact investing space very much. So they are not very fair with the role that they could. Play and the potential unlocking of capital or of um, commercial capital that they could do in order to support the sector. So that's a, there's a huge amount of education that needs to still be done amongst the grant funders um, that are operating in the sector. Then the other thing is around, as I mentioned, the regulation. Although some might want to play in the sector, but the regulation and type of registration that they have in the South African context still stop them from being able to play directly in financing of businesses. They can as a technical assistance, but in directly financing a business, it's still a bit of a problem unless they are not registered as a public benefit organization and don't get any tax breaks from the receiver of revenue, then they're able to do that. So there's a lot that still needs to be done in order to position the grant funders that are available outside of government grants to be able to actually work in the impact investing sector, per se. Great, great. Thank you so much, Sibo. And I think um, we're, we're a little bit past the top of the hour, so I want to move ahead with our agenda. We wanted to give the floor to a couple, uh, a couple of individuals who've been with us for quite a long time. Um, and we have Timothy and Zyorka from, from USADF, who I think uh, shared some particular comments on this, uh, you know, this particular perspective uh, in the chat box. But Timothy, are you with us? Do you want to just share um, maybe yes, a, a minute or two? Yes, welcome to me. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so I wanted to say that um, <clears throat> there are many organizations that offer grants and they have a lot of experience 
And I can speak about USDF, which is a US government agency. And um, we give grants and we provide uh, technical support uh, to those enterprises that may not uh, be able to qualify for investment from commercial sources. And a very good example is an um, institution that has got uh, capacity for growth, they lack internal systems. We can provide a grant that will help that entity put in place the systems needed. And then post the grant, they will be able to, um, they will be able to, 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 to present a case. Uh, to formal investment uh, institutions. And uh, this is something that we have seen across Africa. We work in 22 African countries, mainly focusing on Sahel, Horn of Africa, and the Great Lakes region. I would say in the last five years, we have been able to give in excess of 114 million US dollars in grants. And um, our focus is agriculture, off-grid energy, and youth-led enterprises. During the COVID-19, uh, something that we tried uh, is to implement what we call a CARES program, which is Capital for African Resilience Building and Enterprise Support, where we were able to deploy about 1.5 million within a period of two months. Uh, that is getting money out to support SMEs uh, that were either going to close down and you know what would happen to that SMEs that are linked to smallholder producers. Uh, so that working capital was able to help them either pay for uh, supplies that they had received from, SM, from smallholder farmers or to pay even salaries to ensure that they retain a workforce, but also to streamline the internal operations because we know that markets uh, have been disrupted and we now see a lot of ent enterprises that are going digital in terms of trying to see how to access uh, how to access um, uh, how to access markets and because of that we have been able to partner with a consortium of other institutions and in a record period of two weeks mobilized to five hundred thousand uh, dollars that we are deploying to ten uh, enterprises, three in Ghana and uh, seven in Kenya. And our goal now is within the next three months, we are going to pull together 100 million US dollars, which will make it available to agro processors across, uh, across Sub Saharan Africa. So, this is simply to say that um, yes, uh, we all play different roles in the ecosystem. There are those who are giving uh, investments, whether it is um, uh, it is uh, repayable loans uh, with uh, interest, but there are those who give uh, grants, uh, targeted grants that help entities to really position themselves and be able to access uh, uh, investments where they were not able to. So I don't want to speak a lot. Uh, my name is Timo Dinzioka and I'm the regional a director of program of operations for Sub-Saharan Africa and USADF, for those who are not very familiar, is a 100% US government agency. We are small, we only focus in Africa and looking specifically at economic growth uh, as our main uh, focus. So I'll stop there in case of uh, those who are interested, I can put in my, uh, my email at the bottom uh, for people with me, but otherwise you can also uh, look at our website www.usadf.gov. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timothy. And it's really wonderful to hear that, that you guys are able to sort of be, be deploying that much needed capital right now. So if you are an entrepreneur who maybe is in need of, of some support, I would strongly recommend you do reach out to Timothy. Timothy, please do share your email in the chat for the participants who are with us. Um, the last and before, we, before, you, before you move on, please just give me one second. I also wanted yes. to say that uh, as USADF, we are proud to have supported AVPA to organize this series of, um, of webinars. Um, we have a grant to AVPA and although they had not uh, put this as one of the activities to demonstrate our flexibility, 
uh, they were able to come back to us and say, hey, because of COVID-19, I would like to run a series of, um, of webinars. And we said, yeah, um, go ahead. And they uh, reallocated some funds to be able to do this. Because out of this, there are lessons. They'll be working on documenting. Uh, and I don't want to speak for Nancy and, um, and Frank. They'll be able to talk about that. But we are very proud as USFDF to be part of this very exciting initiative. Thank you. Thanks so much, Timothy. And, and yes, Thank we will be publishing um, some insights from, from this series of 10. So we will be definitely sharing that with everyone who's attended the webinar and, and also more broadly as well. Um, so there's one final individual I would like to call on um, and give a big round of applause to. James Gattere has been with us for every single webinar we've hosted. Uh, he's not missed a single one. Um, so James, we would really just love to, to hear from you. And if you can turn on your video so we can see you, that would be nice. Um, and just tell us maybe in a minute or two why this series was so interesting to you and maybe how it's, um, what, what impact it has had on your work or your perspective, we'd love to hear. Over to you, James. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, uh, my name is James Gatere. I work for INM Bank Foundation. This is a, a new foundation, a new corporate foundation set up uh, last year to just make, uh, bring more direction to the CSR work that the bank has been doing. As I tuned into these um, uh, webinars, the 10 of them, they've been very helpful. Some of the learnings that I was looking for, even as I was coming into these webinars, were just seeing what are others doing and what kind of innovations are being addressed around the COVID-19 pandemic. And then you start learning that the interventions are at different levels, some at higher levels needing government interventions and large donors but some are at middle levels and some are even at the grassroots level. So there's a whole cross section of the different things. You start learning that the pandemic is not a spike so that uh, people are saying, oh, we're waiting to go back to normal, but it's very much like a plateau. It has moved you to a new level and you need to operate at that new level. We realize that many people throughout the different um, uh, countries, have very, very similar um, um, emergency um, responses. And those emergency responses around care packages, cash transfers, hygiene, awareness creation, information creation. But then it's trying to see how do we move to the next step beyond that and just listening to different people's perspectives of what they're doing there. Learning about being careful about selecting your implementing partners. And uh, as a corporate foundation, we do look quite a lot about the accountability from those implementation, implementing partners. And then, yeah, and just sharing knowledge from the different places. What are some of the gaps that I have um, still hold, even as we're coming to the end of this? It is still thinking about the smaller SMEs and how we're building their capacities and thinking about their need for business plans and data. Unfortunately, I come from a corporate foundation and we really speak a lot about those hard tangible items and how that would actually be seen as we work with implementing partners. And even as we see some of them becoming businesses that are sustainable for the long term. There's some lingering questions around things around mental health, stress, depression. All this mental health is the key and trying to just figure out what that would look like. Lingering questions around online and virtual interventions for the informal settlements. Many things happen at a higher level and you try to see how do we do it at the grassroots level. Lingering questions about how to support uh, the new people with the greatest need. Many of the people who have just lost jobs and are struggling to adapt and change and just trying to figure out how to support them. And these are all learnings that I'm learning even as I've been part and parcel of this webinar, this series of webinars. And uh, just very briefly, what has we as INM Bank Foundation done so far? We have been involved in emergency response 
as a foundation, we work through partners and we've been involved in emergency response and providing care packages. And um, we're involved in developing a smartphone app that can work in smartphones and uh, tablets. And basically we're speaking about delivering life skills um, trainings and mentoring sessions in the informal settlements to many people who don't have these facilities. We're also involved with um, supporting vulnerable communities' ability to rebuild and learn to cope with the new normal while avoiding infections and how they can move forward post-COVID. Those are some of the interventions we as a foundation are doing. True, as the bank itself, there are various interventions that the bank is has done vis-a-vis you know, -vis the COVID, and that is repayments, holidays for loan facilities, extension of loan um, tenors, additional funding for COVID-19 affected businesses, etc. And those are the kind of things that we're doing as we continue to learn how do we work with this um, pandemic. And thank you very much. It has been helpful to me. It has been useful, eye-opener, can we continue with this? Thank you so much, James. And as you rightly said, I do think there is a lot of still unanswered questions that, that are going to persist <laughs> through as, as we all sort of learn through this pandemic, but really appreciate uh, that this was valuable to you um, in your work. Uh, Margaret, if you want to go to the next slide for me, please. I just wanted to uh, quickly highlight some of the the sort of successes uh, I think that, that we've seen through hosting this series. So Margaret, go ahead to the next slide. Just wanted to highlight where people have logged in from <laughs> for these series. So we've had 49 countries represented um, from across, across the globe. Um, as you can see here, uh, slightly less than half of our participants have come from the African continent, quite a number from Europe and Asia as well. Um, in terms of our online reach, um, we've, we've reached about over 70,000 individuals through, through our social media campaigns around this, and we've had over 1,000 shares, uh, particularly on some of the content that we put out um, on social media. Um, so, Margaret, if you want to go to the next slide. In terms of the people who have attended, um, it's been quite diverse in terms of stakeholders. Um, we have had uh, quite, quite a number of NGOs and foundations that have joined, quite a significant percentage of entrepreneurs as well, um, but we've seen a wide, wide variety of, of organizations, entrepreneur support organizations, governments, uh, academic and research-based institutions, investors, consulting firms. Um, so, Thanks to all of you who were able to, to join and be part of this. Um, Margaret, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, the, I have just a few um, quotes here from folks who have shared their insights with us in terms of why they thought this was helpful, and I just wanted to share those with you all. Um, if anyone has additional stories of, of, of how this series has helped them in their work or impacted them, if you found a partner on this series, please do let us know. Um, my colleague George is, is putting his email address in, in the chat box, and I'm sure if, if you've registered as has helped you, whether it's gained additional visibility for your organization or funding uh, partners, we, we do want to know. Um, so please do, do let us know. Um, and thank you once again for joining us for this series. We really appreciate it. And Nancy, I will hand it over to you. Um, Margaret, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Thank you very much, Ariel. And thank you to all our wonderful speakers today. Um, uh, Thank you, James, for your wonderful comments. And uh, to Timothy, um, I wanted to put up a slide there just talking about uh, uh, USADF. Uh, as Timothy had said, uh, USADF have, has one of our biggest sponsors for AVPA. And so we really appreciate um, all that they've done to help us. And I think he mentioned that 
uh, over the last few years, the, the organization has actually invested more than $115 million directly into uh, a, thousand, a little over a thousand African owned and operated entities. So anybody who wants to reach out to Timothy, I put his email address in the chat box. Uh, I hope you don't mind, Timothy. I think you had said you were going to put it, but I didn't see it. So I, I put it up for anybody who wants to reach out to USADF. Um, and then I'd like to give the last uh, word to Frank as we close this series. Uh, we will be, we will be uh, putting together a white paper uh, that will summarize uh, all that we've learned through, through these 10 sessions. Um, and I, I just want to also give a really big shout out to Sankalp Dialogue, who have uh, been a wonderful uh, team to collaborate with around this initiative. Uh, over to you, Frank. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and uh, to everyone who's joined us once again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us through this time. Hopefully, we've added value to you in more ways than one. Uh, we look forward to um, continuing to work together this is just the beginning of the partnership between Suncalp and AVPA. So keep an eye out uh, for some of the things that are yet to come. So to James Gatera, some of the stuff you were talking about around SME support and stuff like that, um, which, which those are at the core of what you're trying to you know, address and we're looking forward to um, providing hopefully some ecosystem support to address some of those issues you've raised. Uh, I'd like to thank Suncalp, uh, USADF once again, uh, some of our board members who are on the call today, our chairman, Yemi Kadoso from Nigeria, Vice Chairman Julio from uh, Kenya, Patrick Gomi, who is also in Nigeria, uh, for all the support they've given us in the background to make this happen. Uh, but most importantly, for the speakers today, gracias, thank you so much for the time, Asanteni Sana. And for the uh, people who have taken time to join us, we don't take your time for granted. Uh, please take this as an opportunity for us saying we're very grateful for you. Um, this were designed for you. We hope, as I said again, we've added value to you and we look forward to staying in touch. And please, uh, you've got our contacts there. Uh, we are available 24 seven from both uh, organizations. And please look out for a couple of really interesting things. Uh, on the radar, in particular, there's a study that we've just done, uh, we're concluding now with uh, Telecap uh, that's looking at the social investment landscape uh, space in Africa. We did it across uh, nine countries, um, three in East, three in South, and three in West Africa. We are concluding the study. It should be out hopefully in the next four to six weeks. So please look out for that. Uh, and and uh, it should be a very interesting study that kind of sets the scene of the social investment landscape space in Africa. And there are a couple of other things that we're working on that should be made visible to you in, in a fairly short time. So without further ado, thank you so much. Um, please, if you've got any questions, we'd love to hear. Uh, some of your comments, uh, like the one James put up about what are some of the gaps that you still would like to see being addressed. Uh, we might find other ways of trying to look into those issues. So please, we'll keep the chat, op the chat open for another maybe uh, three or so minutes. Let us know what you'd like to see, the areas you're concerned about. Uh, but hopefully, we're here to help you solve your problems better, cheaper, faster. Thank you so much, and uh, keep going. Appreciate it. We'd also like to hear from anybody who's made uh, some really great connections through uh, this webinar series or has received uh, funding or support uh, through this webinar series. Uh, we'd like to capture, you know, some of the success stories. So please, please share with us, reach out to anybody on that, um, uh, that slide and uh, yeah, give us your information. Mm -hmm.